I try to do the renegade stuff that doesn't have a home, you know, where there isn't somebody else who focuses on it necessarily. You know, if you have a weird invention that doesn't make sense to take to Y Combinator or Sequoia or something, then, you know, that's the kind of thing that we would like to look at. So if I'm an inventor, I'm going to come to you because, you know, you do have some pretty strong relationships and a pretty interesting, deep work that you've done in the world on some life-changing inventions. So maybe you could tell us a few. I went to work for Jeff Bezos to start Blue Origin to build spaceships. And the idea there was, you know, hey, we have this advanced toolkit from computation. We have all the knowledge from NASA and Russia, and we can come up with new ways of, you know, advancing building in space, you know. And that was 2001. And so, you know, here we are 24 years later, and, you know, they have a rocket that works and, you know, private space programs like SpaceX are, are real. And in some sense, these are things that are at the beginning. But I realized after that, you know, there were all these other areas in technology that Silicon Valley wasn't going after. And I ended up going to work for Nathan Mirvold and Bill Gates to build a lab to invent new technologies where we could just do that. We got our team got 6,000 patents on our own inventions there. So it was a pretty large scale operation. We have a lab that we built in Seattle that has one of every tool in the world, one of every kind of scientist, all working together to invent new stuff. And so with the Deep Future Fund, we just do startups and lots of them. What are the kind of values or what are the sort of areas that you're looking for? Since we're putting out a clarion call right now yeah. to all potential inventors or investors, yeah, right? what are you trying to do? The way I think about it, the closest thing we have to miracles in the world is new inventions right? It's new technologies that can help us solve the problems in the world at a larger scale. And, you know, you could think of all the things that humans do as kind of version one, you know, we built railroad systems and coal power plants, and we figured out how to grow a lot of corn and turn it into (laughs) corn syrup. You know, we've done all these things that we need to do just to kind of get by. But now we know so much more, our toolkit is so much bigger, and we can measure everything, we can understand everything, and we can reinvent how we do these things to make almost everything faster, cleaner, cheaper, better, more humane. You know, those are the opportunities. And that's why it's so exciting because if you get a technology that gives you a 10x, 100x, 1000x multiplier on how you do something, that changes everything. And especially if you aim it at the big problems, you know, the things every human on earth relies on, you know, that could be food, but it could be energy, water, waste, sanitation, even construction, apparel. Nobody gets by without any of those things. Like you need them all. And Silicon Valley has been busy making iPhone apps to have drones deliver weed to their dorm rooms or something. You know, we're not really aiming the so-called tech industry at the big problems. And that's why I'm so excited. And, And when you find inventors, that's what they're working on. They're like, hey, I know how to solve a big problem. That's what they want to do. And so those are the people that I like to find and and we're helping get more and more of those things off the ground and we're building an actual tech industry instead of just a big software industry. It's exciting. In Alaska, what did you first start dreaming about like that that made you (laughs) want to go into this sort of area, you know? Well, I was dreaming about getting out of Alaska, (laughs) going somewhere where people knew more about computers than me and um, it took a while. But what I was dreaming about the most was having a computer with more memory a faster processor. And at the time that really mattered. Now I don't dream about that at all because, you know, you got two teraflops in your pocket right now. We have so much computational ability that even kids in South America can get on AWS and rent a supercomputer, you know, like it's, it's pretty cool. So we're in a world that's no longer computationally constrained and it's helping us do all of these other things. You know, the things I described, we couldn't do them without the computational ability, you know, designing that ship or making it sail itself, you know, that's because we have computers to do it. And if you're making a Tesla or a rocket or a, you know, hypersonic jet or whatever, you design it in software, you test it in software, you crash it in software, you do that thousands of times for different designs until you find one that really, really performs and you go build that one. And so that kind of efficiency is a big part of what's making deep tech so much more practical now than than people think hardware is hard. Yeah, it's hard, but all the easy stuff's been done and it's not as hard as as it was. 
You know, it's not as hard as when, you know, we had to build the auto industry or the airline industry. <laughs> Those were really hard. And what we got to do now is, is hard, but we have better tools. You know, a lot of these companies that you find are not in the well-traveled paths, huh? Well, that's the thing. The inventors can be anywhere. And so it's one of the side effects, I think, of, you know, the way we think of technology is, you know, so Silicon Valley centered or something, but that's just because that's where all the opportunists go. And I'm not looking for opportunists, I'm looking for inventors. And so they could be anywhere and they don't leave the basement. So, you know, you got to draw them out of the woodwork. <laughs> right. But I mean, how do you even go about looking for them? Because it's like they can be anywhere. So do they just naturally come to you? There's kind of like three main buckets or, you know, you got the colleges that have something they figured out in research that they want to spin out and commercialize. And I do some of that, but the other second bucket would be like engineers who think their company is not doing the right thing. And then the one I like the most is just these crazy hackers who are in a basement, and nobody ever heard of them, and you can't find them. You got to get them to find you. And so I'm kind of a lightning rod for these people. So I try to get them to come to me. And I think that's the way to get the, the good stuff. So how many people are trying to get to you? And then how do you cut down the list to something that you actually think is reasonable? Yeah, well, the side effect is you attract both fringe wackos who think they have something that isn't real or isn't what they think it is. So I have to sit through that. But mostly I also attract a lot of people who just don't have something that important or that good. So it's easy to weed those out. And a lot of it is just noise because it's just software or, you know, like right now, every day I get a bunch of pitches for AI for human resources or AI for insurance claims or AI for this or that. And, you know, I don't do any of that. So it's easy to decline those things. But, you know, I'm looking for the the weird. So and honestly, I'd say like right now, it's probably maybe even a majority of the stuff is maybe you didn't invent something, but, you know, you might have a nephew who's like super smart and you don't understand what he's doing, but, you know, send him to Pablo's. So that's kind of the, right. <laughs> I've got Nobel Prize winners sending me people like that now. So that works pretty well. And, but I, but I really think I can go a lot further with this by just spreading the word more. And so that's why I do my podcast and I'm writing a book and all those things. And I think it's really going to grow the amount of stuff I can source. So a lot of times a company like that, when you meet them, they may just not even know how to get from where they are to the next phase, right? Sure. So how do you communicate with them that dance of, well, this is what we need to do to get it to the next place, you know? Yeah, that's, I think, a big difference between the kinds of companies that we work with and the kinds of companies that we're used to seeing. A lot of, you know, Silicon Valley in particular, I like to pick on Silicon Valley, uh, sort of over-indexed on entrepreneurs and they love entrepreneurs. We support entrepreneurs. We celebrate them. We fund them. And those people, you could say on average, just want to make a business. They don't even care what it is. A lot of times they just want to build a big business. And you contrast that with an inventor, they've spent their career at a lab bench trying to figure out something and they figured out something special. And the next logical step is to make a company to get their invention to go somewhere. That's not what they wanted to do. They, weren't they didn't set out to make a company. They were just trying to get their invention to go. And so a lot of times there's a big difference between those kinds of founders. And, you know, you really need both. And I think we had got the wrong story in our heads in Silicon Valley. You know, we thought it was all about the entrepreneur. That's why most of the tech companies, you know, don't have any tech. They didn't invent anything. What did Uber invent? What did Airbnb invent? Like what, what new technology did they bring? They're just opportunists. And I'm not saying those products suck, but we're deceiving ourselves if we think that that's what technology means, right? Technology is when you take the output of scientific research you invent a way to apply it to solve a problem and you bring a new thing into the world. I mean, that's where we need to go. And so, you know, when I look at a lot of these startups, I, what I see is I got a technical founder that maybe have something that's amazing, but they don't know how to build a company. And the truth is we've gotten such a sophisticated playbook around that, thanks to the successes in Silicon Valley, that it's really hard for someone to become that entrepreneur. And I think we've been telling ourselves the wrong story. You know, a lot of advice is you can learn that stuff. You can be the entrepreneur. I think you can be the founder, 
but you really need somebody who's wired to build a company. You know, there's a lot of things I suck at. Like I suck at managing people. I can sort of fake it. I'm not the worst manager, but I'm not like waking up in the morning thinking about what does my team need to thrive? You know, I'm waking up in the morning <laughs> thinking about something else. So I think I shouldn't be the manager in a lot of cases. Right. And some version of that is true for a lot of people. Maybe even, you know, you probably know what you're good at and you've got other folks to help with the things that you suck at. So yeah, I think a lot of it's about building teams and that's really where it starts. Now, also, you've narrowed the things that you you focus on. So what are you interested in, you know? Yeah, whatever you're doing in the world, you kind of need to focus a little bit. People think I'm unfocused because I do a wide range of stuff, but I narrow it too. So for example, I don't do life sciences. And the reason is lots of people specialize in that. I also have a bad attitude about the FDA. And so I try to <laughs> avoid the stuff, you know, so I wouldn't do new drugs or biotech type stuff. But a lot of other people are focused on that. And that's great. They don't really need my help. I try to do the renegade stuff that doesn't have a home, you know, where there isn't somebody else who focuses on it necessarily, you know, not always. But, you know, if you have a weird invention that doesn't make sense to take to Y Combinator or Sequoia or something, then, you know, that's the kind of thing that we would like to look at. And, you know, a lot of it's advanced physics or new areas in science because I'm so focused on big problems, it goes back to those things I talked about. I want to solve problems in energy or food. You know, in health, we do some things, you know, we're doing some things around data. You know, there's so much potential to understand a person individually and personalize how you take care of them and their nutrition and stuff. So I think there's a lot of data related things that we might do you know, if there was a breakthrough in how you analyze that data and how you deliver something special. So we're doing things like that a little bit, but by and large, I'd say anybody with like crazy hair and a DeLorean is probably a good match. <laughs> <laughs> now in Silicon Valley, you have companies that are founded and they just want to build them to be big companies. And they basically have their sort of capital and people all the way through that entire funnel. Yeah. You know, there's people who specialize in every little piece. The more revolutionary a technology is, the least amount of resources are around it. So it's like, how do you analyze where a market's going to go and all the things that you have to do to actually get there? Yeah. So there's a couple interesting things going on. The first one is, you know, if you think about the kinds of companies we're used to seeing, tech companies, software companies, they're usually evaluating two kinds of risk, right? You've got technical risk, which is like, can you build this thing? And market risk which is, will anybody pay to use it? And most startups are taking no technical risk. If you can draw an iPhone app on a napkin, we can probably build it. They're taking market risk. And so they have these milestones like product market fit, which is, you know, will somebody pay to use this app or something? And the difference is we do the opposite. We take technical risk up front. We're trying to evaluate something that's never been built before and figure out, could this be built? Could it be cost effective? Could it be scaled? Those kinds of questions. But I almost never take any market risk. So I'm trading technical risk for market risk. And a couple of things about that, I'll use an example. You know, we have a company making cargo ships that are autonomous and they sail themselves. They're zero emissions, no crew, no fuel, no emissions. But that's the shipping industry. That's a massive trillion dollar industry. There's unlimited demand for shipping, more or less. And for zero emissions shipping, there will be even more because it's a lot cheaper and cleaner. So we don't have market risk problem. We just have this vast industrial market waiting for us. We have a company recycling gold out of electronics waste. Well, gold literally defines liquidity. There is no product market fit problem for gold. You can sell as much as you can get. So this is what investors are missing. And I think a lot of founders are missing is that if you have market risk, that's infinite because markets change and move and go up and down. But for what we're doing, it's industrial markets that never go away. They never get smaller. They just grow. And so we don't really have market risk. And, and technical risk is finite because the day that first ship sails, there's no question that it works. So that's one part of it. And then the other part quickly is the investors who built the software industry, what I call SaaS holes, you know, those sure. people have a lot of risk now in their business model because what they've been doing is just applying software to every business in the world. And that's been done. And it's super dilute because everybody's doing it. It's getting easier. You can just talk to ChatGPT and tell it to make an app for your insurance company now. 
So the opportunities there are pretty minimal. And so the investors are running out of things to do. They went from like SaaS to Web3 to AI to, you know, whatever. They're following these hype cycles now, but it's very competitive. They're looking for a needle in a haystack, of course, because there's only a few hits that justify the kind of investing they do. And so a lot of them are being won over. You know, you see now there's a deep tech renaissance, like people are starting to shift their funds from doing the thing they were doing, looking at deep tech, looking at doing the technologies that go after these other industries. And it's just, it's a, another way of thinking about it. If you add up the entire software industry, including Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, Oracle, whatever, all of it combined, the whole internet ecosystem, about $2.3 trillion. Well, shipping's $2 trillion, right? We're going after energy. That's $15 trillion. Food is a trillions, you know, durable goods is trillions. We're going after these industries that Silicon Valley ignore. And that's what deep tech is really about in my mind. So it's it's exciting time. How many people are in your company now? There's two of us. <laughs> I mean, you can't do the analysis on all these companies yourself or just the two of you do? So there's a lot I can't do. You're right. And we do a lot of companies because we invest only in pre-seed rounds. So we're usually the first investor into these very high-tech things. And that's pretty unusual. A lot of investors will lie and say they do pre-seed rounds or seed rounds, but they really just want to be entertained. <laughs> they just want to see the stuff early. They're right. not really going to cut checks then. So we only do that. And what it does is allows us to really go after a very important funding gap. It allows us to help get more of these companies off the ground, help them get venture compatible, you know, make them look like a startup that a seed stage investor could back. And that's really important because all of those guys, there's a lot more of those guys than there are of me, and they're beholden to what we do. You know, they can only invest in the deal flow that exists for them. And so if we can feed them more good stuff, then more good stuff will get back. And so, yeah, it's a lot of work. The truth is, I'm not starting at zero on a lot of these things because uh, I had a weird career where I worked on lots and lots of different deep tech stuff. So I understand a lot of the problems and a lot of the technologies already. So usually I can get pretty far pretty quickly in figuring out because we really invest in the technology first. You know, everybody else will say they invest in the entrepreneur first. And we certainly think that's important, but we think, you know, if Travis had been given a nuclear reactor technology, <laughs> instead of an iPhone app to make taxis magically appear, we'd have a much better world. You right. know, so what we're really trying to do is get these things going. Sometimes the job is to attract an entrepreneur for the team, like we talked about, but there's a lot of work, that kind of work to do for them. But we start them off. If I can't figure it out, and I do see often things that are outside my areas of expertise and things I know, but I'm lucky to have a really deep network of people who know. I've got world-class experts in everything on speed dial. So that's that's how I cheat. All friends. You know, we're at this moment in time where we seem to have more computation. Well, we do have more computational ability than we've ever had before, but it's just going to get bigger and bigger as we see quantum computers and things come in. You know, 2000 years ago, the most innovative thing in the world was a wheel right? To take your vegetables to market. You know, at this split second in time, where do you see all this going? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, probably whoever invented the wheel was assassinated. <laughs> and then for a couple of generations, yeah. you know, killed off all the wheel people. And yeah. then the kids were like, screw you, dad, wheels are cool. And, yeah. You know, that, that's kind of the, you know, developmental cycle that new technologies have to go through. You know, we're probably in like junior high with social media, we're in, you know, preschool with AI, you know, we're at different stages with these things, but they all have a lot of promise and they all have a lot of potential. And, and there's just process for humans to learn to wield these things. These technologies are tools and we have to learn to use them. And so we're kind of at the beginning with some of them and further along with others. Have we seen just an obsession now with, with chat GPT that takes us into this one area, which is not necessarily everything that AI can do, yeah. you know? Well, I think, you know, the cool thing about ChatGPT is it speaks English or really any language at this point. But, you know, if you can talk to a computer, that's new. And it makes this particular AI very relatable and accessible and useful in a way that 
all the ones before it, you know, were really only accessible to nerds. We've been making AIs. You've been using AIs for 15 years every day. You use Google Maps. That's an AI. And it's an AI that knows how to show you your possible futures. It shows you a blue line to work. It shows you a couple of gray lines that you might take if you want to stop for tacos or gas or whatever. And you, cho you choose where you want to go. And it shows you is it possible to get there, how to get there, the best way to get there? And so it's a tool for you. And we don't think of it as an AI. We didn't call it an AI, but it's the same thing. It's a, it's a model of the world that you can use to run simulations. ChatGPT is a model of language, and you can simulate all the things. You can simulate an essay or a screenplay or whatever you want to do, but that's a model. You don't ask it to tell you how to get to work. It doesn't know. <laughs> Like it'll make some shit up, but it doesn't know how to get to work. And certainly don't ask it to drive you to work. It doesn't know how to drive a car. Tesla has a model for that. So, you know, farm it out to Tesla. So we will build thousands of AIs, all of them built for a purpose and trained on appropriate data and tuned to do a good job and weed out the failure modes and all those kinds of things. And they'll learn, you know, you might start to invoke them with chat GPT. Or you might invoke them with an iPhone app. Who knows? But the point is, there will be thousands, and that'll all happen this year. And it's very exciting because fundamentally what these things do is they help you make better decisions. The same way Google Maps helps you make a better decision about traffic, how to get to work. That's what these things do. And we're going to be using them for our businesses, making better decisions about how to run businesses. And eventually, in a century, we'll use them to make better decisions about government too. <laughs> And that's going to be an awesome future. You know, you'll be able to ask an AI, hey, what is going to happen if we pass this 800 page bill that Congress is voting on that no congressman's ever read? <laughs> Just let us know, you know, what, what are, what's actually going to happen? Right. It might be nice to know before we pass it. And so I think we can improve a lot. How do you think about then, you know, upskilling folks and young people to accommodate? You know, we've got to get the ships, they're going out. We don't need a crew. What yeah. are we going to do with the billions of people? that are inhabiting this planet. How do you think, or do you think about that when you're thinking about all of this? I mean, we made billions of people, but we haven't really done as much work as we need to do to take care of them, to provide for them, right? Yes. And so their needs start with energy. You're made of energy, literally, and we didn't make enough. You know, Americans get about nine times as much energy as the average Earth. That's not cool. So yeah. we got to solve that one. That's why I focus on deep tech. Right. We got to provide for the people we have. Now, they need more than energy. They need food. They need water. They need jobs or they at least need an income, you know, those things. And the truth is, there's a lot of things humans are really optimized for that robots suck at. And so, for example, my daughter, when she was in school since the beginning, had 30 classmates, one teacher, and we would complain about overcrowding and student teacher ratio and you can go to the PTA and argue about it and maybe get down to 27 to 1. But if you think about the best learning environment, well that's 1 to 1, right? That's a 1 to 1 student teacher ratio. That's when you have somebody who knows you, understands you, cares about you, can put a challenge right in front of you that's not too hard, not too easy, help you grow. You know, my kid wasn't the bad kid and she wasn't the best kid. So she's in the middle. The teacher has got to teach to the lowest common denominator. Yeah. She's getting left behind. Nobody's paying attention to what she needs because she's doing fine. And that seems like a w sad waste to me. So if a robot takes your job, please rejoice. Be a teacher. <laughs> like, we're, you know, this is not a technology problem. This is a human's values problem. We are yeah. not choosing to deploy our resources and our people to do the things we actually claim to care about. Mm. We're choosing to have them do a lot of dumb stuff that robots could do. A great example of this was truck drivers. You know, for 15 years now, you've been reading about how self-driving trucks are going to displace all the quarter million truck drivers in America. And you know what? We're 15 years into that. Zero truck drivers have been replaced. There are 50,000 open truck driver positions in America right now. And sure. I don't know a single teenager whose ambition is to drive a truck. So we're just using humans for the wrong thing, right? Like, let's take those truck drivers and turn them into teachers. So we have we think of technology like, you know, a digital twin or a holodeck or, you know, we think of them that way. But to really get to this future that we're talking about, 
you know, let's just set, take that example where we we instantly replace all the truck drivers. Not that I think we're going to be yeah. doing that anytime soon. What do you think the next version of humanity looks like? Because yeah. all of a sudden there'll be lots and lots more free time and they can do the things that humans do really well, imagination, creativity. But it's like, what do you think it looks like? Yeah, well, I think, you know, look, free time is a kind of new phenomenon. You know, the industrial revolution probably coincides with the invention of free time 100 years ago. A farmer today can work five times the land his father worked and still have time for leisure that his father never knew. Entertainment industry didn't exist 100 years ago. Books, movies, music, elections, video games, all these things we're doing to fill our free time. That's all new. Right Before that, what humans were doing was working and we're evolved to work. And right now we got, you know, call it half work and half free time. Say the best case scenario, we solve all your problems and you don't have to work. You get 100% free time, right? What would you do with it? And that's why I think we're kind of in this junior high phase with free time. We haven't really figured out how to be productive with our free time. Some people have. It doesn't just mean work. A lot of it is build community. How do you socialize kids? How do you make better humans? How do you make better societies? How do you take care of the elderly? How do you apply yourself? You know, humans are very social creatures and we have all these very stunted social interactions. What if we could focus on that? You know, I think it can be a beautiful future. Look, one example I think is when we do solve energy, we're going to change the world dramatically. And the reason is when you look around the world, what are these wars all about? I mean, their access to resources and their access to energy. And when we solve that problem, when every human on earth can get as much energy as an American, what are we going to fight over? We're going to be in an inadvertently peaceful world where people can then start to aim themselves and their resources and their attention at things that they care about. And I think that humans that are younger now and better than us will eventually figure out how to focus on making the world more awesome. And I, I think it's going to take some time, but that's what I believe. Doesn't it seem like in a way violence, even though it doesn't appear all the time, it is getting less and less over time, but you know, we're still fighting over a lot of old things, religion, things like that. If we free people up, do you think that some of those things might get a pressure valve release that puts us in a more equal world, a, a more human rights organized world? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You can see it now in a way. Japan is a very interesting place that sort of peaked out on population if population decline. And that's a very difficult thing to handle. And most societies are not handling it nearly as well. They're kind of just going down slow and happy, uh, mm -hmm. which is interesting. I'm not sure that that's not what's going to happen in Russia or South Korea necessarily, but we're behind the curve on that. We're not in population decline yet. And so that's one of the big challenges. And I think what's interesting is you look at some places like in Saudi Arabia, they have a massive young population. It's a very young country. And so they're very family oriented, very community focused. They're really doing, I'd say, kind of an admirable job in some sense of figuring out how to navigate going forward. You know, places like Nigeria are on a massive population boom. They're growing. They have a lot of problems and challenges. But that's one of the major things is, can you grow a society and take care of people? And I really think that that's what it has to come down to. You know, you have to focus on that and you have to figure out what is it going to take for our people to thrive. And right now we kind of got it wrong. I'd say we thought that what they needed to thrive was an iPhone and a Tesla. That's a start, but they need to figure out something besides Instagram to do with those things. But the things that you're talking about, you still have to be able to afford those things. Those things kind of follow a trajectory where, you know, rich people have to waste a lot of money to make a market for them early. That's iPhones and Teslas. But then we figure out which of those things are good, which are valuable, improve economies of scale and get them to everyone on earth. I mean, we're really close to having a smartphone in the hand of everybody who can have a phone. And before long, that'll be pretty close to zero people that can't get a, a smartphone. And thus internet and thus YouTube and Wikipedia and all the things that are there. And then they'll have to go through the, you know, frustrating developmental process of building an immunity to all the stuff that's online that sucks. But I think of it as like a evolutionary process, like 
we all got addicted to alcohol and overdid it and then kind of got it under control. And then we did it with cocaine and then we got it under control and we do not eat sugar and we're getting it under control. And that's the same thing with social media. And we did it with Instagram and email and instant messaging and YouTube. And we're, you know, you got to get these addictions under control. Some people it's easier. Some people are, it's harder. Sometimes they need help. You know, those are things that we have to learn to manage. And that's just the next phase of human evolution is like, we got to learn to figure out what is positive and what is not and start to tune for more positive. You know, when you left those big organizations and you started to look around at innovation, when I'm talking to you, sometimes you're, you know, you're all across the world looking for these things. How do you find yeah. these things and how do you, you know, like, okay, somebody calls you from a certain place and you think the technology is cool, but you don't know any of the people. Like, how do you just even trust that you're going to make that investment and do that? Yeah, I I think there's got to be, at least for me, there has to be a breakthrough. There has to be some significant advancement. If you look at what an engineer at a Fortune 500 company in auto or aerospace or whatever, what they're doing, they're looking for a way to make their company like 1% better. And I don't have an interest in that. I'm looking for a way to make the company a hundred percent or a thousand percent better. And if I find something that has that kind of multiplier, then I'll bet on it even sometimes even if the team sucks, you know, because I know the technology, we might have to grow or change the team over time, but the technology is going to be valuable and it's going to make a difference. And so that is a very unusual approach. Most investors can't and wouldn't shouldn't do that. But since I'm investing early and I'm focused on technologies, I can do that. And we offset that risk by doing a lot of companies and, you know, in venture, in the best case scenario, it's a hit that pays for all the things that didn't work out. Do you always see kind of the end game, you know, or what has really piqued your imagination? Anything that you could speak to? You already mentioned the cargo ships, but other things that in the future that you just say, yes, that's a great thing. Yeah, like we have one that I'm really excited about right now. So I helped start a company called MakerBot. I was just an advisor for them, but that was the first consumer 3D printer. It was the moment when the world could see a 3D printer. In fact, the founders had never seen a 3D printer when they, when they started MakerBot. Until I showed them mine. It, it was 2007 or something. It was very early in 3D printing. And what we thought was, wow, these things are great because they're programmable. A 3D printer doesn't care if it ever makes the same product twice. So you can just draw something in Minecraft and click print and it'll come make it for you. And so that really seems like a better way to make stuff. And we imagined that we'd make farms of these things, put them in data centers, and you just wire them up to the buy now button. But here we are almost 20 years later, and you don't buy anything from Amazon that's 3D printed. Yeah. And so there's two big reasons for that. One is that they're like one pixel printers, so they're very slow. The other reason is that they require these high quality input materials in order to be precise. And so at the end of that, you're competing with injection molding, which is the cheapest way to make anything. So Asia has been winning on making cheap crap forever. So I found these guys who invented a way to adapt a different type of 3D printer that does kind of a layer at a time. It's called a powder bed printer. So it does a layer at a time instead of a pixel at a time. But then they adapted it so that the input material is used coffee grounds from Starbucks. So they literally get paid to haul this stuff away. They dry it, put it in the printer, and they have a binder they invented that goes over it to make the parts. And you just pick up your part and shake it off and you've got something that was 3D printed. But the point of all this is that it's cheaper than making stuff in China. <laughs> and so now the economics have flipped so we can reshore manufacturing. We can do it in the US fully automated make products on demand, get rid of all the supply chain risk. We're keeping biomass out of landfills and sequestering carbon and all that too. And it's just this exciting moment because we finally get to realize that vision that's all, you know almost 20 years old of making factories with 3D printers. And they're doing it. They're making sinks and faucets and light fixtures and bicycles and all kinds of stuff out of coffee. Wow. Yeah. And they could do it with other biomass too. They use sawdust now and seaweed. It's really cool. A company's called Marvel Labs. It's really great. And they're building their first factory right now and shipping parts. It's awesome. And Amazing. what about a company like Clear Sky? 
Yeah, that one's really cool. I told Jesse about this company that we recently backed. They invented a way. So if you have a factory or a power plant and you have a smokestack, you know, a lot of people don't see these because we've moved them out of cities in the U.S. There's 20,000 smokestacks in North America. And what's happening is you're burning some crap to make heat. You need that heat to run a steam turbine, to run a generator, to make electricity, or you need it to make steel or whatever you're doing. The smokestack, you're usually burning coal or gas or something in there. And then these toxic fumes are coming out the top. Well, these guys figured out they could cryogenically freeze the exhaust that's coming out. It's a mix of different gases, and those gases freeze at slightly different temperatures. And so the cryogenic system precisely freezes the gas, and they can siphon out and liquefy nitrogen, CO2, oxygen, hydrogen, different gases. They pump it into a truck and sell it. That's crazy. So this is this <laughs> is literally turning pollution into profit. Wow. They're often able to make more money some, than, than, than the people running the smokestack are in the first place. And so it's a way to just literally take pollution directly from the source and turn it into a saleable product. And I love that because, you know, charity doesn't scale. Philanthropy doesn't scale. You know, you can't solve the problems in the world with that kind of capital. Yeah. You need business. Business scales. And so for the scale of the problems we're going after, a lot of the solutions I see aren't going to put a dent in them. But something like Clear Sky really can. That machine, they don't even charge. If you have a smokestack, call us because <laughs> they don't even charge you. Right, we'll set it up for free and split the profit with you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's really. a pretty easy sale. Wow, amazing, Great. Pablos. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> My pleasure. I'm really glad we got to do it.